Halcyon, the Book of Pyman, is a fantasy horror podcast inspired by historical events and characters. This is a work of fiction and was created, developed, and produced by a multicultural team of various religious faiths and beliefs. Professor Pyman lives in a dangerous world. His story contains themes of violence, gore, and attempted sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. statue on one of the smaller docks of New York Harbor. His black cassock gently flapped in the light breeze coming off the Atlantic Ocean, while he breathed in the air of salt and watery decay. Neath his outwardly serene demeanor, Father Michael O'Malley was anxiously stealing looks over his shoulder. Today was the day he had long awaited, a day Father O'Malley felt was well deserved. He glanced right, then left, barely moving his head. He could have sworn someone was with him, watching him this whole time, but it wasn't until he heard the creak of the worn wooden boards that he was now certain he was no longer alone. A papal decree was issued by Pope Pius X, stating that certain religious relics would be graciously distributed around the world in the hopes of spreading the power of God Almighty. Father O'Malley's mind raced. What precious piece of Christianity could the Holy See have sent across the Atlantic to be proudly displayed within his own parish on Coney Island? His thoughts were interrupted by a man, a strange accent calling out to him. A tall, broad-shouldered man in a simple black robe and a wide-brimmed black hat was walking up to him in the bright afternoon light. The large brim obscured Father O'Malley's full view of his face, casting his feature into shadow. A nun followed in the visitor's wake, taking two steps to his every stride. The stranger extended a large hand towards Father O'Malley, who took it in his own with a small bow. Ah, you must be Father Michael. I am His Most Reverend Excellency, Ivan Volkov, Bishop of Moscow, and special messenger of our Holy Father. Father O'Malley embraced the bishop and gave him the kiss of peace, touching one cheek and the other with his thin lips. The bishop towered over Father O'Malley, who looked up to study the man's dark features. The bishop kept his large, strong hands on Father O'Malley's shoulders as he spoke, a large, toothy smile across his newly revealed face, which looked surprisingly youthful, save for the deep lines around his eyes. His companion, who was at least a full foot shorter than the bishop and looked older than Job, blinked bright blue eyes under her habit squinting against the sinking sun. She had a small item tucked under her arm and redirected those coolly assessing eyes on Father O'Malley. Sister Margaret and I have traveled many long weeks to arrive on your shores. You must be very excited that His Holiness has chosen your parish for such a gift. So, I will make you wait no longer. Am I to follow you to your ship? I imagine it must be something 
quite substantial. All the way from Rome. The bishop shook his head, then gestured to his companion. Sister Margaret held a small parcel. She unwrapped the dark velvet cloth, only to reveal an ornately decorated wooden box, which Bishop Volkov plucked from her grasp and placed in the awaiting hands of Father O'Malley. It's barely the size of a tin of sardines. This? This is it? I thought I would be getting a large cross of gold or one of the saints bonded Do not flatter yourself, Father. Pride is a sin, after all. Open this only in the strictest of privacy, for there are others who would take them for their own. These are not to be displayed, nor are they to be mentioned in passing to anyone. Do not be foolish. His holiness would not idly send out these holy relics without a reason. The bishop pulled him in close. There have been incidents in Rome and in many other larger churches all over the world most recently in London. So, hiding them in smaller churches is what His Holiness has deemed the best course of action. We fear even the Vatican is not safe. It is your holy duty to safeguard these until such time as we return to collect them. Do you understand? I understand. The bishop's sudden change in demeanor startled Father O'Malley. His friendly smile morphed into a hard-set jaw as he surveyed Father O'Malley's face. The priest's alarm gave way to disappointment as the realization that he was serving merely as a placeholder instead of a glorious shrine for the masses set in. He quickly recovered his wits and met the bishop's dark-eyed stare. Good. The bishop released Father O'Malley and took a step back, a warm smile returning to his face. Sister Margaret stepped forward and laid her hands on the small item, replacing velvet cloth and folding it once again into a neat parcel. She then laid her hands on Father O'Malley's arm and gripped his wrist with surprising strength, inclining her head toward the wrapping. I've studied history and relics for longer than you've been alive, my lad. They are what you think they are. Hold them close. Keep them safe. We have other business to attend to in the city. Other relics to ensure make it safely into the hands of their caretakers. It was a pleasure meeting you. I bid you farewell and may the Lord our God bless and keep you. Please, let us go, sister. The bishop brushed past him impatiently, followed steadfastly by Sister Margaret. Father O'Malley stood dumbstruck on the dock as the gulls cried out loudly overhead. Father O'Malley quickly let go of his resentment and turned on his heel to begin the trek back to his church. As he milled his way through the throngs of merchants, fishermen, and the dock workers, the curiosity that tugged at his mind won out, and he ducked into an alley and opened the small box Bishop Volkov had given him. Inside, Father O'Malley observed three rusted iron nails. Father O'Malley scoffed as he closed the box, and turned his thoughts toward the eventful night for which he needed to prepare, paying no heed to the shadow that followed. A shadow that was not his own. Later that night, Father O'Malley hastily drained the last of the communion wine and covered the last of the bread on the altar. He had breathlessly been waiting for the final mass of the day to end. His feet and back both ached, the waves of pain and stiffness ebbing and flowing more so than they had in his younger years. The priest took a moment to think back to the days long ago when he was able to stand for each service, fervently delivering God's word, the rites, the rituals, the sacrament to his flock for hours on end with zeal, 
God's holy flame and glory burning through him. Amen. But Father O'Malley knew full well, as the years dragged on, that his other, still fervent, though less holy fire and ache, burned furiously as well, just in other parts of his body and soul. Yes, all these years they smoldered in deeper, hidden away places, and that was where he was keenly focused, which wiped away the rest of the day's events and disappointments in his mind. He tucked thoughts of the nails. <laughs> they certainly couldn't be those nails, no matter what the bishop said, away, and set his mind on a more tantalizing prize. The newest altar boy, who had just recently joined the church's ranks, Daniel Wilkins, had still not attended Father O'Malley's special orientation. Tonight would be the evening the young man saw, as Father O'Malley put it, his passion for God's true forgiving light. These were the moments for Father O'Malley to bring the young ones closer to God and closer to himself. The passion, renewed, stirred beneath his robes as Father O'Malley escorted young Daniel Wilkins through the winding halls of the church, behind the altar, through the rectory and to the door of his lavishly decorated office. He pushed the large, heavy oak door open and beckoned the boy inside. Father O'Malley slowly closed, then locked the door behind him, turning to look down at the boy as he began to remove the sash from his well-fed waist. My son, do you remember the temptation our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, endured in the desert? At the mention of this holy name, the boy, another orphan brought up by the Sisters of Perpetual Grace, made the sign of the cross over his chest and bowed his head. Father O'Malley crossed himself as well, then closed the short distance between them and lifted the boy's cherubic face to meet his eyes. This will be the first of many lessons for you to teach you that the sins of the flesh and unholy lust are against a sacred word that we may succumb but then must be repentant as father o'malley raised a hand to pull at the fastening on the boy's robe a large shadow rose from behind the antique desk at the window obscuring the light from the newly installed electric lamp the dark shape of a man was now fully formed in front of him coalescing from a dim outline into the sharp detail of a tall gentleman dressed smartly in a three-piece suit and bowler hat. He held an ornate cane in his left hand, topped with a scorpion whose ruby eyes glinted as light came back to the room. And there was something else, rusty and metallic, in his right hand. Father O'Malley squinted to try to discern what the man was holding. The blood in his veins ran ice cold as the realization set in. The nails, the thing, the man, was holding the nails. Rage filled Father O'Malley, a burning sensation in his chest. He stepped forward, standing between this interloper and young Daniel as he shouted. You feigned. Faith, how dare you invade the sanctity of this place? I have you clapped in irons for your insolence and thievery. Father O'Malley knew God was on his side, though trembling. He gathered himself up and stood tall. This is the moment all priests train for, to truly battle the forces of Satan. With young Daniel looking on, the priest proclaimed, In the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, I will rebuke you, and in his name command you, give me your name, O blasphemous minion of hell. Ha! Ah! What do you want, you most unholy creature? Oh, I think you know. Saint Michael, the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May, may God rebuke him. We humbly pray, and, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell, 
Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world, the ruin of souls. Amen. Oh, I've met the archangels, including Michael. I've never been all that impressed. The man's sinister voice seemed to travel across the room and shake the books from the shelves. The ceiling lights and gaslit wall sconces swung as though an earthquake had struck the small church. Little Daniel retreated to the nearest corner of the room and folded in on himself, tucking his head between his knees. Before the priest could blink, the visitor melted back into shadow, and with a force unlike anything he'd ever felt, struck Father O'Malley hard in the chest, squeezing all the air out of his lungs. Before the priest even realized what was happening, his body was hurtling across the room, much like the papers the newsboys threw every morning on the steps of the church. As realization struck home for Father O'Malley, his body was hurled through the rectory, out of the sacristy, and into the main aisle of the church. Trying to catch his breath, he found himself airborne once again as he rolled down the aisle. His head violently struck the door to the entrance of the sanctuary. He wanted to scream, to cry out to heaven, but there was no breath left in his body. The cold darkness seemed to gather about him, curling around his limbs, snaking around his neck, squeezing challenging him to resist. Satan was at work tonight in New York City, he thought. He was the shepherd of his flock. Father O'Malley found his strength and set forth to deal with the now shapeless entity, threw open the sanctuary door. The priest sucked in the respite of the cool night air and found himself in the solitude of the prayer garden. He'd lost control of nearly all his faculties and of his bodily functions. Gathering what was left of his will and remaining wits, he tore the crucifix from his neck, held it toward the black mass, and shouted the rites of exorcism. The world around Father Michael O'Malley fell away once again into a dark, deep abyss. The last thing he remembered was the shape of a man, faceless, eyes aglow. Father O'Malley drifted into unconsciousness, a prayer the last words on his lips. The atmosphere seemed to shift to solid matter as Father O'Malley regained consciousness. He looked around and found that he was lying behind the pulpit of the church. The large crucifix of the altar loomed over him as he found the ability to move, or at least the initiative to try. He quickly remembered the man, if he could be called that, whom he had seen in the garden, and his eyes frantically scanned the church for any other person who might be present. To his relief, the shadow and the heavy feeling had left him, God had saved him. Father O'Malley sighed in relief and prayed. Loving Lord, I express my gratitude to you in prayer. May it be a pleasing, joyful sound to you. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Amen. The chilling and familiar deep voice answered, echoing in the darkness. Father O'Malley's head snapped up to see the same man from the garden standing over him, smiling. That same unholy flame flickered in the stranger's eyes, but he said nothing else. In the light, his features looked like any other man. But those eyes... The visitor took Father O'Malley's left arm, then pulled and twisted the limb into unnatural angles, lifting the priest into the air. Father O'Malley's mouth opened to let out an agonized scream but a black gloved hand forcefully covered his mouth. The stranger's voice seemed to be everywhere at once. Shh, no, no, no screams, or I shall have to cut out your tongue. Releasing the priest's mangled arm in his face, the man delivered a savage blow that struck Father O'Malley in the jaw. Grabbing his hair, the stranger pulled the old priest's face back up to meet his own. Gasping and sputtering, the blood and teeth pouring from his mouth, Father O'Malley mumbled, What? What do you kill me for taking on the burden of the flesh from this boy? Hmm. You know, when I arrived here tonight, I was in search of items of great power. 
My plan was to simply take these artifacts and disappear into the night, as I have many times before. But your intended lessons with that boy, as much disdain as I hold for your race, I couldn't just stand by as you preyed upon one weaker than you. So tell me, how does it feel now to be a fly caught in the spider's web? He struck Father O'Malley again, his fist sinking deep as the orbital bones gave way. Grasping the bloody collar of the disgraced priest, he lifted him off the ground. I'll still take them with me. I've been searching for them for a long time, you see. The stranger tucked the grainy, ancient pieces of metal that had just arrived today from Rome into the pocket of his vest. So, these will have to do. These are for you, Father. As he spoke, he produced three small daggers from his jacket. Tell me, in the hour of your tribulation, are you as willing to die for your own sins as the carpenter was? And all your precious martyrs? Or will you cry and beg for your life with all your human frailty? Oh my god. God? God. Hmm. God. God's not here. But here am I. The dark stranger walked to the crucifix. With unnatural strength, he ripped the metal statue of Jesus away from the cross and threw it across the nave of the church. Father O'Malley felt a hand, grasped his ankle, and found himself, dizzy, turned upside down in the air. He could now feel his back against the cross. As he felt the first knife pass through his flesh, his ankles being pinned to the cross, a faint whisper emanated from Michael O'Malley's lips. God, forgive me my sins. Show my soul mercy. Nothing. There was no deliverance from the searing pain as the metal passed through his left wrist into the cross behind him. His tormentor used no hammer, only the force of his bare hands. I know that I am weak, Lord. I have been weak. Deliver me into the arms of your Angels. <laughs> Father O'Malley gasped as the final blade passed through his right wrist. He lay there, inverted, looking out on the chapel that he had presided over for many, many years. Tears began to fill his eyes once again. The priest's sight began to fade in and out of focus, and he felt a gloved hand stroke his thinning hairline. The light caress turned into a violent jerk pulling Father O'Malley's face abruptly upwards. The malice he felt in the stranger's voice chilled him to the core. God has forsaken you, Michael. Your prayers have fallen upon deaf ears. Forgiveness has turned to punishment. Mercy to cruelty. You have been delivered into the arms of an angel. Just not an angel of God. The dark outline of the man turned to light, blind, radiant, but deadly. An agonizing scream filled the church as Father Michael O'Malley's eyes sizzled and burned out of their sockets. As Father O'Malley breathed his last tortured and ragged breath, the stranger turned his back on the gruesome scene, laughing that dark, growling laugh, if only to himself.
As the man entered the office, he found Daniel lying in the corner, unconscious but otherwise unharmed. He never could comprehend the weak constitution of mankind, losing their heads and falling faint when overcome by fear. What to do with you? The man asked as he lifted the boy from the ground, studying his serene face, but sensing the torment in the boy's cataleptic mind. Professor Pyman could hear young Daniel's hummingbird pulse thrumming through the boy's carotid artery, and so he knew the child was alive and must be dealt with. The bundle he gathered up in his arms was motionless, exhausted, and still in shock, no doubt, from the night's events. I guess the kind thing would be to just kill you and save you from your race's hellish existence. But no... No. There's been enough death tonight. Sleep now. You'll remember nothing. Let me take you away from this place. Pyman reached two fingers up to the restless boy's forehead. As the pressure on Daniel's forehead increased, he slipped into a deep, comforting sleep, dreaming of daring feats above and spellbinding sights below. As Daniel drifted into the sweet nothing of dreams, he heard the distant trumpet of elephants and the musky smell of the slow decay of hay and alfalfa and the music of a calliope playing a cheerful circus tune. Upon depositing the boy with one who could tend to him, Professor Pyman returned back to his wagon on the circus grounds. He lit the lantern and searched his shelves. Artifacts and curiosities lined the walls, some gently and reverently resting in ornate boxes and others set in rows, neatly catalogued, or floating in greenish murky fluid in jars or beakers. They were garish, and they were beautiful, in so many ways like all his lost children. Each one gave him its power, and to them he added three metal nails, carefully wrapped in a dark velvet cloth. He felt the energy surging through the metal, calling to him, reaching toward him. Soon, he told himself. Soon enough. Halcyon, the Book of Pyman podcast, and all its entities are a production of Pyman Media, LLC, all rights reserved. Halcyon, the Book of Pyman is written by Shannon Lynn and James Gray, directed and edited by Jared Huffaker. Music and sound effects provided by Epidemic Sound. All episodes are available wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And Professor Pyman asks for you to please rate, review, and subscribe, and visit halcyonpodcast.com for more information.